here to talk today about the state of the art for rare disease treatments. It's, it's obviously a huge area, so I won't be able to really cover everything that's going on, but I'll try to give you a sense of it, uh, of the field and what, what's going on in the rare disease space. A little from my own perspective and a little bit about what I see um, is going forward going to be uh, the challenges for us. The, um, I think if you had to summarize the whole story, it's there's been dramatic progress, but there are serious challenges and dramatic progress because there've been so many technologies now that are successfully treating diseases and in a very specific underlying cause way. I think that's the, the evolution of gene therapies, antisense oligonucleotides, siRNAs, enzymes, proteins, antibodies, small molecules, chaperones, all kinds of other approaches. And a lot of them are working and many of them approve. And I'll talk through some of them today. And the strategies are novel. The original, we talk about replacement therapies, but now we're seeing things that help manage a result that might otherwise thought to be impossible. And I think it's exciting to see so many first ever rare diseases getting studied and treated these days. But there have been a lot of challenges. And I think the world, for some reason, is becoming more difficult in terms of the regulatory and reimbursement world. There's more demands, more increasing demands as if there's an infinite amount of money when working on a disease that affects a rare disease. And I'll give you some examples of that, but I think it's been the number of demands from the number of regulatory agencies across the world has just dramatically increased the cost. And this really threatens the potential that we may not be able to use all the science we have to treat as many patients as we could. One of the key areas is not only the failure to accept, but the derision of biomarkers in rare diseases as being an appropriate way for treatment. And I would argue to you that many of the biomarkers are a more accurate way to measure disease activity than many clinical endpoints, which are highly confounded by very complex factors. And we need to change that story because I think there are many diseases and many of the ones that are rare now that are not getting treated are neurological diseases where the long-term timeframes, the complexity and variability and irreversibility will make it very hard to design and develop drugs using very slow and unresponsive clinical endpoints. And I'll give you some examples of why that is. But I think the last thing is, of course, cost and access and the concerns of these very expensive therapies is there are more and more of them. How are we going to be, how is it going to be sustainable? And if we build these drugs, will people be actually get treated? And we can talk a little about that at the end of the story. I do think these are all solvable problems. I think they're all within our sphere. The truth is the biology, the science is the impossible part that is now getting solved. And if we can't solve the other parts of regulation reimbursement, then that is, of course, a sad moment when it's really all within our hands and spheres to think through those solutions. So my own story, and I, last time we spoke, which was five years ago now, which it seems like with the pandemic between, I think it, it seems like ages ago, but it was five years ago. I talked about you know, my own story in the beginning as a assistant professor in a bungalow and developing an enzyme replacement therapy, finding the money to do this and getting it finally through the process. It was incredibly challenging and had its own story about biomarkers initially accepted by the FDA, then rejected by the FDA and a complex randomized trial required, which in my view is not needed. But when you look at the um, program, I think for me, one of the most powerful things was I was considered myself an academic physician and doing research and basic science, getting grants. But when you're in the room with a family getting a first infusion ever, and I was able to do this with the first 10 families, it's a transformative moment when you can be there and press the button, start an infusion and open the door to uncertainty. Rather than certain death, the child now has a different possible future. And the story of Ryan took a great turn this last year because a 30-year journey came to fruition with him now married. I went to his wedding last year. He's been on enzyme therapy since 1998. And so, you know, 24 years on enzyme therapy, survived, grew up, and I was able to attend his wedding. And that was the story I'll put in 
Saving Ryan, which is available now finally. It's a good story for from the standpoint it talks about the struggle to develop a treatment and work through the process. So any families trying to do this for themselves or startup companies, others can kind of look at that struggle and understand what it takes. I think the most important thing though is you can get through and despite a series of of very difficult uh, challenges throughout that, including getting acceptance of biomarker endpoints, um, we're able to get through and change Ryan's future. And that's what we always hope to do. Now, when you look at the state of the art for rare disease therapeutics, most people tend to credit the Orphan Drug Act with everything. Like the credit Orphan Drug Act is the cause of all improvement. And I think the Orphan Drug Act was quite important and it was a good start, but it really didn't move the needle yet. It was a starting place and it provides some incentive. But the truth is it still costs a lot of money to develop a drug and tax benefits don't really matter. And it's it doesn't matter if there's no one else developing it. So in the end of the day, it actually isn't quite enough. If you look at the first 10 years of the Orphan Drug Act between 82 and 92, actually there weren't that many complex, sophisticated drugs. Most of the drugs developed were, you know, were um, like small molecules that were being repurposed. There were a few antibodies type drugs for cancer. And I don't think of cancer so much when I think about rare diseases, but you talk about complex uh, products for rare genetic disorders. There are really only a few. I put a couple here. The truth is there was a lot of things that were missing complexity of technology, development strategy, and financial support because large investments for those type of products were involved. And it's highlighted my time at that, in those days in 93, I was trying to get, I went to a company called Orphan Medical. There was a company called Orphan Medical to work on orphan disease. And I had, I wanted to work on my MPS1 program. And they told me, no, your disease is too rare for Orphan Medical. And I thought, well, with Orphan Drug Act, doesn't that help? And the truth is, it takes far more money and Orphan Drug Act is nowhere near enough. So the question is, what, what has been happening and why have there been so many more programs? And if you look at the history, and this is a, the Orphan Drug Approval, it's really since around 2003, there's a period where the, there's a rapid growth, both all drug, all orphan drug approvals, but a lot of the complex biologics, which is dark bar. You know, you might wonder what, what happened. And one of the things I believe that happened is in the late 90s, the, um, the work with Genzyme had with Ceridase, which was a drug treating only a few thousand people, but was very expensive was generating enough income to actually justify the investment in other programs. That investment beginning in the 98 range, this is when Biomarin got started and where I was involved, and approval of Aldurazine was 2003. And from that point, there was a rising trend, you know, increasing the number of biologics uh, through to today. You know, when I look at what's going on, then what, what's the cause of this improvement? And I think people think about the drug legislation. I think it's had some effect and advanced technology definitely has opened the door to more treatments as well as how to do clinical development. But, you know, regulatory policy has changed somewhat, but in some ways, for example, with biomarkers, it's gotten maybe more difficult at times. It's highly variable whether you can get improvement here, but there have been some improvements and some acceptance of what's required of the requirements. I think the financial potential though has been helping create a situation where you can attract tens of millions of dollars of involvement required to take an ultra rare disease through. And if it wasn't there, it wouldn't happen. And I just want people to be really clear about that. And we're gonna come back to that as we talk about access as well, right? But without the financial potential, there's no way to get the kind of investment required to actually develop an effective drug and do it promptly. Now, the experience of some of the ones I've been involved with are shown here. So I've been through a lot of programs. All of them involve an academic scientist. And, and sometimes when I'm on Capitol Hill, they, they tell me that you know all the scientists invented the drug, the company didn't do anything. And I think all these scientists developed an idea for a drug, but an idea that you treated a mouse with, it's not a drug. The difference between that and a, and a drug that's approved is dramatic. It's 10 to 100 times more money and dramatically more effort. And I think it's really important that the partnership between industry and academia is extremely important to this. But 
when I was a scientist, I came up with an idea for a drug, but to truly make a drug that is an approved product that is listed and available, meeting all the standards um, around the world is a far bigger task and involves a lot. And you know, this is true for one reason. People ask me, well, you know, that's just because, you know, what companies are doing, but Every year, there are thousands of patents, therapeutic patents out there, right? Thousands of them issued. But yet there's only, let's say, 30 to 50 approvals. So what is the difference between thousands of patents and 30 to 50 approvals? Why are there such a difference? That's what the industry does. The industry has to work through thousands of possible ideas for drugs, figure out which ones are plausible, do the development. And among some of those, they do succeed and you end up with a few drugs. But that difficulty of conversion, I think, is one challenge that is really part of the state of the art and the challenge we have. Can we make it more efficient? My original program was here with Dr. Neufeld, and she cloned the gene, and I worked with her in getting to the clinic. And I've told you that story before. It was quite, quite uh, looking back, I would say it would be impossible to do it again. I was very lucky with the way we were able to get through, but it was, it was at the edge of the cliff for many years. If you look after that, another program that we were able to develop, MPS-6 enzyme therapy, this is John Hoppo who invented the science. And this is an example where manufacturing was actually the difficult part. This enzyme was very difficult to make. And two companies started working on this and quit when they figured out how hard it was to make and how costly it was. They said it wasn't viable to make it now, Byron picked it up and we had developed a very complex perfusion culture process to make this thing, but it was quite expensive and the product is expensive. But because it was expensive, a lot of to do this costly thing. And over time, they helped manage the cost of manufacturing, but the product was does work, is approved, and has really changed lives for Morchio patients. I mean, excuse me, Maritola me patients. Now, another case example of update a little more nearer term in the last in the last five years, the SLI syndrome, MPS7 enzyme replacement therapy. Now MPS7, the big challenge for this one is there's only 20 patients in the whole United States. And because I had developed other MPS enzyme therapies, I was committed to trying to get this one done. In the picture here is Bill Sly standing next to me and Bill and his wife attending the first infusion of an MPS7 patient with a enzyme replacement therapy. This took every possible angle we could on biomarker endpoints, a complex novel clinical endpoint strategy, managing cost of manufacturing, and to try to develop a treatment that's going to have, it still has around 20 patients in the United States on treatment, but yet it's changing their lives. And this little boy who was in terrible situation was really close to dying is doing really well as a grown up. He's been on the enzyme therapy um, since 2013. So he's been on therapy nine years and he's done, done pretty well. He's still a physically uh, harmed child, but he has definitely done well. And we saved his life, no doubt, since he was on death's door. So you can do it, you can get through. Now, one of the other things that's happened, I think that's been exciting is sort of the the change in the route, taking drugs we have and putting them a different way. And so one of those was just putting enzyme therapy in the spinal fluid when you're trying to treat the brain, because getting into the brain has been always difficult. And the early work was done in around 99, 2000. And very soon there were a number of biologics, including antisense organolucotides, enzymes, and antibodies, and other things that people are putting in the intrathecal space to treat the brain. This program ultimately um, originally devised by Dr. Lobel, he wasn't a big fan of the intrathecal enzyme, but the gene therapy program actually failed, partly because you need a large amount of enzyme, they couldn't get enough made. But when you do the enzyme replacement, you could give enough enzyme. And this is now approved and treating kids with late infantile Batten's disease. But again, solving a problem with a different way, but just changing the route administration and using an enzyme. But the idea was had, but it took a lot more work to get through and actually develop a successful treatment. Now, past the enzyme therapies, I worked on PKU, and 
in the last few years, there's been a new one, Palling Zinc, developed, which is an, uh, an alternative enzyme. Instead of replacing the missing enzyme, you're using another enzyme from bacteria that you've coated with plastic, essentially, and are using that to shunt off a toxic metabolite, phenylalanine. Kuvan is like a chaperone type therapy, two different ways of, of working on the same problem, and they work in different types of patients. But again, new types of technology and approaches to solving a medical problem. This is work from Dr. Scriver and Dr. Koch, and it was very pleasing for them to see the work become something. Pal and Zeke originally was thought to be, was planned to be an oral therapy, but it was not going to work. That was Charlie Scriver's idea. And it ended up needing to be an injectable pegylated version. And that's what we came up with. So the idea helped start the program, but it ended up becoming a very different drug. More recently, um, we were able to get a product called Dojolvi approved. This is a, a, a triglyceride of, C of C7 fatty acids. And it's an, a clever engineering of metabolic pathways that are altered in patients with fatty acid oxidation defect. So it's a small molecule that actually restores the Krebs cycle and bypasses the genetic defect. Dr. Rowe, shown here, recently passed away, but he had spent 12 years studying patients clinically in his clinic, and no one would pick up the product and develop it because it was a weird looking oil and people thought they just didn't know what to do with it. We were able to pick up the program, get it developed. It's now approved in the US and Canada and Brazil and around 300 kids in the United States now getting access and treatment. We heard about a heart failure in the other case. These kids also can potentially get terrible heart failure, but by providing a, um, this bypass um, and drug that restores the Krebs cycle, the patients can actually metabolize energy much better. It can re re reduce heart failure and prevent um, significant effects on a muscle function as well as um, hypoglycemia. So it's a, it's a way to engineer metabolism using a small molecule. Not everything has to be super fancy drug therapy to actually change the future for patients. Most recently, um, a recent approval is another strategy, and this is for a disease called achondroplasia. In the upper picture is Dr. Ray David Ramoyne. He passed away a few years ago now, but he was a big skeletal dysplasia person down at Cedar Sinai, and working with him on the right lower was Bill Wilcox. In this disease, there's a defect in a signaling, transmembrane signaling uh, protein a receptor, and that defect turns that sig receptor is always on. And I looked at this disease myself and I would say, there's no, how are you going to treat this? This is an intrinsic broken receptor. There's no way to do it. But Dr. Wilcox came up with an idea to use another hormone that created a, an equally opposite downstream signal. So instead of fixing the broken signal, you would stimulate another receptor that had an equal opposite downstream signal, just knowing the signaling pathways through ERK. And, um, he showed that could work in cell culture. And so at, at Biomarin, they made a modified C nature peptide variant that was stable that could actually, once a day injectable, actually get to the cartilage and balance out the signal and improve the growth and bone structure of these kids with achondroplasia. Showing you another, what was impossible bone disease and finding a way forward by knowing the biology and I think it's another example of how even impossible diseases can come up with solutions. We're working on another one like this now, Osteogenesis Imperfecta, which has a defect in collagen. And we all thought, well, we have a defect in collagen. It's very hard to fix that and prevent the brittle bones. But it turns out if you simply um, look at these patients carefully, you figure out that they're actually over resorbing their bone. They're actually they're, all, they're making their bone weaker in a maladaptive response to the abnormal collagen. If by you simply turn on bone anabolism, you can balance out the bone and in animal models make their bones have normal strength, even though the collagen is defective. So it tells you, even though we think we know what's going on, when you get into therapeutics, sometimes you discover more. So let me talk, so again, this is another one, a gene therapy. And the, the great promise of gene therapy is that some of these completely impossible diseases like spinal muscular atrophy, which is due to neurons being lost in the spinal cord, 
can be successfully treated with an IV therapy that delivers a small amount of the protein. And that got approved on these data showing improvement in, in motor function using the CHOP in 10 score. A very exciting thing. And I had so many families SMA struggling before and to have something moving, moving forward, I think is very exciting. It just shows how the door is open to treatment of disease that we couldn't treat before. We've done a work on glycogen storage disease. I'll skip through this. It was another enzyme therapy, but for a different, but for the liver, and that's in uh, entering clinical trial phase three trials. sRNA and other nucleic acid therapies have shown incredible work. This is work of an sRNA to the liver and for acute um, intermittent porphyria disease, which has these serious acute attacks. It was a cause of disease and the madness of King George. If you saw the movie of King George, it was a, a metabolic defect and the sRNA blocks the creation of a toxic intermediate with a, an incredible 90% reduction in TAC rate. This is an siRNA into a nucleic acid therapy. I think a very exciting piece of progress in the siRNA field. There've been a number of siRNA uh, improvements. The last thing I'll touch on from therapeutic development is the incredible progress on gene editing. Now, I think gene editing is still a ways off in vivo. Ex vivo, I think there's a lot more in control, but the first experiments in vivo, that is where using an LNP, a lipid nanoparticle, there was a delivery of a gene editing um, agent by the company Intelia and showed they could chew on the TTR gene and knock down its expression. It's a protein that tends to form fibrils and cause a neurologic disease. And they were able to knock that down in humans using uh, the LNP. And I think very exciting work. And I think for the knockdown purposes of something produced in the liver, um, this seems like a, a really credible step forward. Whether you're gonna replace genes yet, I think that's a little further out, but I think it is exciting to see that something like this technology coming forth and actually being successful in the clinic. So a lot of great successes, but <clears throat> the downside of all this is costs and expectations. They are rising. The number of studies, the design type, everyone thinks you're doing large randomized studies for some reason all the time for everything, even when it's really unethical or impossible. The amount of work in Europe, for example, pediatric investigational plans they're making us do juvenile talks for different age groups of animals. And the truth is that when it's been evaluated, those extra talk studies are useless. They do not predict anything. They just torture animals and waste money. But all of these extra requirements are just in case there's some tiny possibility of something. And that level of care just drives us into the, into the ground and takes a lot of the ultra rares off the table because it's so much more cost that it can't be done. And the number of requests for validating every single endpoint, well, when you're dealing with disease as like 20 people in the United States, it's really not possible to consider. And we need to have a lot more rational sense and it's being lost. And I would say to you that we need to get the ability to use alternative study designs and analyses and the ability to use reasonable disease activity biomarkers, that is biomarkers from the primary process, primary state of the process, not downstream markers. I think we need to be able to do this, particularly for the more difficult to treat diseases, which will not, won't get treated. And this is a policy change that needs to happen. It also about who's at FDA, who's at EMA, and what do they really want? What do we all want? Do we want to make it so difficult that only perfect things get through? Or do we want people to get their first shot at a first therapy that can lead to the medical evolution of better treatments? So we need to do more. Just to give you an idea, and most of you probably never seen anything like this, we thought it'd be useful for you to see what a filing for approval takes. Uh, it will show you, particularly under yellow box, the MEPSEVI filing, which is for MPS7. I told you the 20 in the United States. This is a filing in the US for approval to treat 20 patients. As you can see, there were 77,000 pages in this application with 276,000 hyperlinks between different documents. All right, there were over a thousand individual documents in this filing. If you look at the Diljovi filing, you can see even more, 228,000 pages. The amount of work it takes to put this number of filings and documents together means an entire team. I showed you a picture earlier of this team. 
if you have that many people working, in the end, the costs are driven up and this just creates unnecessary complexity. It is way over past what's required. I think we need to re realign ourselves on what's really important. And right now it's, I think it's just, um, it's getting to an insane level of work and demands and expectations. So I'm getting close to the end here. I think we need more accelerated approval path. We need to also have reimburses accept that accelerated approval is real approval. And we all as scientists among us need to start growing up and recognizing the disease activity biomarkers that look at actual active disease are actually a more powerful, more accurate way of looking at disease. And that clinical endpoints are highly confounded by a lot of variabilities and irreversibility. And so that irreversible disease makes it very hard. If we create too much difficulty for getting these treatments approved, we'll never get to newborn screening because it will not be implemented. We heard about those criteria. It will not get done because you don't have a treatment. And so right now we're looking at a lot of these complex neurologic diseases that are midway down their course, trying to get them approved on making someone better now with the hope we can actually treat them at the appropriate time. And unless we get to using primary disease by activity biomarkers to get comfortable, we won't be able to accelerate our development. And if you think about HIV and all those other diseases out there, um, you would be impossible to develop HIV treatment without a biomarker. You can't use opportunistic infections to study a drug to prevent AIDS. It would never work. You would never succeed in making a quad or highly active retroviral therapy. Because I'm kind of running a little short time, I'm gonna skip the next part. Um, the Doing the biomarker approvals has been incredibly difficult. I wrote this paper. I suggest you look at it, at how hard it is to get a biomarker approved. This is a five-year period when I did the analysis. And all of the products approved in that five-year period had already been approved using a biomarker or, or a different drug approved in the 1990s before they had a lot of rules. And so once it's been in, then they're grandfathered. But if there's something new, then it became difficult. And since then, I've had a couple that I've seen approved. I had one phenylalanine in, in 2007, but I can tell you it takes an incredible effort and it shouldn't, it should be better. If we had that improvement, we could actually develop for a same billion investment, that's a straight through no failure type number. We could have three times as many drugs developed for the same amount of money if we were better at this. And a lot of those diseases are neurological. That doesn't mean we have a biomarker for every neurological disease, but if you think about how many there are, the benefit to the society being able to get many more products approved more efficiently will actually accelerate our ability to not just get the first treatment, but the second, the third, as people continue improvement. Now, one of the last things I'll touch on to close is um, one of the concerns people have is like these dramatic prices for things and how's that gonna work? And certainly Ultgenx, we, our products are expensive, but we believe in responsible pricing. We've been moving more moderating our price point. And what we do is we basically guarantee in the US that patients will get treated if they're appropriate. If there's any financial reason they can't get treated, we'll, we'll make sure they get treated anyways. That's certainly our commitment, and many companies do make that kind of commitment. But the question is, how are we going to deal with $2 million price points? Um, Zogensma is a dramatic treatment. The effect is worth it, but how many people can we support with that kind of price point? And I think that's a challenge. And I think we're going to see the other side of that challenge is what happened to Bluebird in Europe, where the pricing was less than the cost of doing the therapy for them. And they actually pulled from the European market for this a treatment for thalassemia. Now in the US, just, just this week, Bluebird got reviewed by ICER who, who agreed to the $2 billion price point, which is, which is great. I think that that value is real, but the truth is it's still hard. How do we get access, equitable access across the world when we have $2 million therapies? I do think we have to work on getting better and better at it, but I, I believe that this is a this is gonna be a challenge for all the gene therapy field, how we deal with the true cost of these things and the true value and getting to a point of acceptance and equity. So my conclusions, look, there is a lot of excitement for how much is going on, but if we wanna keep this moving, we need to improve access to accelerated approval. 
and I'm, I'm coining the term primary disease activity biomarkers. These are markers that measure the beginning of disease, which I think are very accurate and are the way forward. And we need to start what I call the, the walk of medical evolution. You can't wait for the treatments to be perfect. You have to start the first one, get it approved, and then drive for better. If I showed you the story of HIV, when that drug was approved, the first drugs were approved on, by, on the accelerated approval, there was predictions that would ruin the whole field of, of drug development, that all this would be just junk. Instead, the opposite happened, and none of those people that wrote those reviews or were at FDA like will publicly remind us what they actually said. The truth was, by opening the door to the biomarker, they started with one biomarker and then realized there's a better one, and they moved to the better one. But in a 16-year period, they had 29 drugs and four combinations approved and achieved highly active retroviral therapy. We're just getting through a pandemic, but some of us remember in the late 80s, in the 80s, when the AIDS epidemic we thought was going to take over the world, and yet we solved it. We solved it with a primary disease activity biomarker and the force of clinical um, development from a number of companies. We got through it. I think if you applied that to the rare disease world, you would see many more drugs approved and we'd start the medical evolution that is a first drug, then a second and a better one. So we have to modernize our view. And in the end, whatever we create, if we can reduce the cost of this, maybe that can reduce the return and we can lower the cost structure of this whole business. But access can't be optional. We as companies and others developing drugs have to build into our programs support for access, for equitable access for products. And it's not just an option, it's gotta be a requirement. So that, that's it for me. Um, and thank you um, for having me today.